jobs, jobs, jobs. The unemployment rate is at the lowest point it has been since 2001. Breaking news here, the economy grew 4.1% in the second quarter. Another month of strong numbers, seven and a half years now of job creation. That is a record stretch. You get up every day and you play by the rules. You're investing in your families. You're investing in working very, very hard. But workers are not gaining their fair share of an ever-expanding economic pie. And why is that? People all across the country working in jobs once considered middle class, but now living far below a middle class lifestyle. A majority of U.S. workers have experienced a decade of flat wages. While income inequality has shot up by as much as 50%. People just are hustling because they don't have a job, they don't have a job that make ends meet, and they have to hustle to put food on the table. The number of part-time jobs is soaring. Are we redefining work here? This is the future of work, Jim. We are at a turning point. Good jobs are not being created and are disappearing. It's a survival economy particularly for low-income people who are systematically excluded from the labor market. The workers who make up the informal economy are the most marginalized workers in the country. They are people of color, they are immigrants, they are women. This inequality that we've been experiencing, this insecurity, is related to informal labor, is related to the fact that workers are not being protected the way they should. What we've seen in the last 40 years is perhaps the greatest shift of income and wealth from the broad middle class to very wealthy people in this country. And it wasn't by accident. At the end of the day, America is an idea. It's an idea about how do you construct a democratic society. The social contract that most of us have in our mind, the bargain that we make with society as a whole, says that we should be able to access relatively stable, relatively secure employment, that basic labor standards, such as minimum wages, health and safety on the job, the right to overtime pay when we work more than 40 hours, We've never actually lived up to the idea of a social contract. We've exalted it in our documents, but the reality of its application in the world of policy and law has fallen far short. If you look at undocumented immigrants that are facing challenges in the labor market, African-American or Latino communities that have high rates of underemployment and unemployment, women whose work has been devalued historically, you see these populations disproportionately within the informal economy. The informal economy for many years was regarded as something that occurred elsewhere. It was a phenomenon of developing economies. The view was that the United States had progressed beyond this. The early work on the informal economy was really focusing on a sector that was supposed to disappear over time as economies modernized. What we now realize is that this is not happening, this has not been happening, and in fact, the informal economy seemed to have grown. I think of the informal economy as a political, economic, and social space that has been created by the law and the law's exclusions. We have a whole plethora of employment and labor law protections, and there are a growing number of workers who are not covered by those protections, and those people are informal workers. So in the case of a day laborer who's working in the construction industry, they'll be hired off the books 
Or you take the case of a domestic worker who may have a verbal agreement with their employer. It could be braiding hair in your apartment. It could be washing cars in the neighborhood. These are forms of the economy that are hiding in plain sight. But we often don't link these together. We don't see the day laborer, the domestic worker, the street vendor as inhabiting a similar set of employment relations. And so we often don't make these connections. And for that reason, we don't understand how vast the informal economy actually is. Bueno, mi nombre es Caridad Vázquez. Soy mexicana del estado de Colima. Este, tengo ahorita 59 años. Mi profesión es cocinera. De la edad de 8 años he sido vendedora ambulante. Hola, que chila. No, y también está picosa la verde, se me hace. We've seen that people have had to participate in the so-called informal economy just to survive. Humans are naturally entrepreneurial and will find ways to essentially better their economic position, whether they're allowed to or not. If you think about Los Angeles, immigrants have fueled that street vending economy and have supported their families by doing so. Yo me casé este ahí en Michoacán. Yo me enseñé a hacer tamales al vapor. Yo me enseñé a hacer mole. Yo me enseñé a hacer quesadillas. Yo me enseñé a hacer todo lo que es un platillo tradicional de Michoacán. Toda mi familia saben lo que yo, yo me dedico, saben a lo que yo hago y ellas me apoyan. Yo siempre que quiero que mi familia quede. Bien. Street vending brings people together. It activates a lot of spaces that would otherwise be lonely or be dark. There's more light on the street, there's more eyes on the street. But low income workers, mostly women, were being criminalized every day for trying to earn a living and for trying to provide for their families. Street vendors throughout the city of Los Angeles. The city estimates there are at least 10,000 such vendors on the streets every day, all of them operating illegally. Street vending is like the wild, wild west because there are no rules or regulations. The street vendor campaign began in 2008, and the women have definitely led this movement. They're the ones who came to us, and they're the ones who continue to fight the hardest. Y díganme que si quieren que se legalice o no, porque si no vendemos, ellos tampoco nos van a mantener. Porque de, de, de nosotros depende la economía. A mí me gusta mucho el movimiento. Y pues ahora que, que, ahora que me uní a la campaña de los vendedores, este, pues uh, yo pedí ayuda, llegó por ILAC, se, se, este, se mostró el interés hacia nosotros y pues aquí estamos en la lucha. They said, you know, we're vending on sidewalks that are supposed to be public space. So why is it that the police are ticketing people on the sidewalks for just trying to make a living? The battle over street vendors turns violent in Hollywood when a man flips over a food cart. That moment caught on video has spread. A woman clutching flowers as a Paris police officer tries to subdue her. Somos dichos criminales porque nosotros este, vendemos en la calle. No porque no somos de este país. No tenemos, tenemos derechos. A ver, a ver, hija. Dependemos de nosotros mismos, dependemos de nuestro trabajo, dependemos de lo que hacemos. A nosotros nadie nos da dinero para seguir adelante. Sidewalk vendors on the streets are not only already vulnerable because they have to adhere to local ordinances and sometimes even not the police or harassment from police officers. And when you are a single parent, or you're a senior citizen taking care of your grandchildren or your children, and this is the only way that you know to be able to provide for your family, every day they set up their stand is a day that they might not come back home. 
okay. It's imposing a huge cost on informal worker and it's creating this sense of fear. And we don't see the same enforcement of existing laws in other sectors of the informal economy. We don't see employers being penalized in the same ways. We don't see consumers being penalized for purchasing goods that are produced informally. It's important to distinguish between the small entrepreneur that they may not have the permits and the workers that are hired informally by formal businesses. We seem to be entering into another era where we're seeing more informalization and casualization of the labor market. We always tout that California is the fifth largest economy in the world, but yet there's people who are not making ends meet. I grew up here in Los Angeles in the South Bay area. I've been a truck driver for almost five years. One of my friends who drives over the road said, hey, come into the trucking industry. When I was introduced to this company, they stated that we're independent contractors. They said, by this model, we can make tons and tons of money. We are the ones who are moving all of the cargo for all of your big companies as Walmart, Amazon, General Electric, Sony, all these stores that everyone goes shopping at. Us truck drivers are the ones who are bringing these goods that you need to have to eat, to clothe yourself, everything that you need. We don't have medical, we don't have social security, disability, we don't qualify. Which one is that? Oh. I'm paying the lease, the insurance, and also an escrow, and all these fees and stuff. They're taking like half of my check. They're putting the cost on us. I seen my paycheck, and I grew angry. That's a lot of money for every day that they're taking. So we started talking to other truckers. What's going on at your company? We found some companies who were charging for the office toilet paper, uh, for parking, for drug tests. Anything uh, that, the, that, that the company needs to cover its own costs can come right from the driver's checks. Why is it only the top percent that's getting all of the money? and not even leaving us with the livable wage. We're not asking for a million dollars, we're just asking for a livable wage. The only thing I can see for our little community over here and is spread the word out to other Samoan community who might not be aware of it, so that when there's a strike, we can all go out there and support. The misclassification of port truck drivers, essentially they are our last indentured servants. They have no rights, they have no benefits, they have no protections. We've been trying to figure out how to help these workers and help them organize and form a union and get some rights, but that's been very difficult. The industry has been very slow to change. They basically get paid by the load, regardless of how long it takes them for that load. They're typically working 12, 14 hour days. Sometimes they sleep in their truck and don't go home at night and they get their check and maybe it's 300 bucks. Sometimes they even owe the companies. In an independent owner operator environment, it's cheaper to cheat him. No question about it. I mean, let's just call it what it is. It is cheaper to cheat him. Good day to you guys. <clears throat> My name is Sekel Wayno, and I'm a misclassified port truck driver. How do I know? The Labor Board has said that we are employees. It struck me what the first gentleman said. It's cheaper to cheat. They're not only cheating us truck drivers, but our families that come along with it. So they're worried about their money, their profit margins, to make sure that the prices at the stores are cheaper. But we're suffering, they're pressing down on us real hard. And that's why we're here to fight. And money is not worth a human life. Thank you.
From the very beginning of the early labor history, we've had people who've not been protected. We've always tried to have a large supply of cheap, affordable, disposable labor to run the economy, to make the economy work. The history of African Americans in this country specifically is really a study of the systematic dislocation of a population from the labor market, either through slavery or through the Jim Crow period. The country was built on cotton and tobacco. Many of our great institutions were built on the profits of that labor. So we've always craved that labor. But at the same time, we feared actually giving that labor the full rights and privileges of, you know, citizenship the industrial era, a time in this country where there was rapacious capitalism and labor exploited to the extent that people were dying on the job. There was no regulation, there was no 40-hour week, and it's not until the late 1800 or so that some social reformers started demanding that the government begin to protect workers. When labor was in its ascendancy and the rights of workers was being kind of enshrined in laws, during that same period of time, African Americans were excluded from many of the major labor movements. It's only when we started regulating labor and protecting labor that we started seeing this official sort of bifurcation between the formal and the informal economy. It's really not until the New Deal, which occurred in the midst of the Great Depression, that we started seeing more systematic regulation of work in the United States. Of course we will continue to seek to improve working conditions for the workers of America, to reduce hours that are over long, to increase wages that spell starvation. Roosevelt passed a number of laws that we now refer to as the New Deal. The kind of security the American people want is a fair chance in life. The people of the United States have joined together in a great national program of protection for the common welfare. What we did in America after the war, it was really we're all in this together. That had a lot to do with building the broad middle class post-World War II in this country. Workers could get a better, a fairer playing field, but we were still leaving people behind then. I want to just lift up my grandmother, who passed away at 96. And she had Social Security, and her Social Security check was $12.90 a month. And she works from 11 years old until 90. My grandmother did not benefit from the New Deal because she was black, she was female, she was a domestic worker. The New Deal did not include black workers. Over 80% of black workers at the time were in the domestic work. They were working in the kitchens and in the homes of white families. It did not include immigrant workers, Filipino and Latino farm workers here in California and in other parts of the country who were working in slave-like conditions. And so as the country moved into this golden age, there were millions of families who were left behind. The systematic dislocation of people of color from the labor force, keeping people away from the ability to benefit from essentially their own work and entrepreneurialism. What that has done is it's driven people underground. One of the largest internal migrations in the history of the world. Over a million people moved from the South to the North and West to avoid the Jim Crow conditions in the South. The Black Codes, Jim Crow, these were all laws that really worked to create new forms of bondage. African Americans were picked up for relatively minor crimes, loitering, being unemployed, being homeless. 
many black families came to California to escape a lot of that political persecution in hopes of a better um, opportunity. When I talk to black elders in Oakland, I hear stories about having worked on the army base and having a good family sustaining job and being able to buy a house. I hear about a thriving black entrepreneurial community, the 7th Street Corridor being a hub for black businesses, and then folks talk about how the crack epidemic, the loss of good jobs, disinvestment in East and West Oakland and in black communities just really devastated Oakland over time. And how we're in a position now with both still feeling the effects of those things and the fact that we're not replacing that with investment or good jobs. We know that mass incarceration disproportionately impacts black folks and brown folks, and one in four Alameda County residents has an arrest record, many of whom are black community members. And so having an, a fair shot at a job as folks are returning from incarceration is critically important to their success. It is very difficult to get a job if you have a felony on your record because you're discriminated against. Mm -hmm. You're talking about people who had maybe accounting jobs when they're inside but get out and can't be accounted. You're talking about people who fought fires for mm -hmm. our state and help homeowners save their homes That's right. but get out and then can't get a job as a firefighter. Right. I mean, that doesn't make sense. I went to prison when I was 19 years old. I served 22 years in prison. When I first came home, it was extremely difficult to become stable. I remember entering into a workforce development program. It was a training for electrical technician work. I went through every training, aced all the exams, all the tests, getting clothing, the buying boots, went through the driving school. And literally the day I was went on site to, to work my job, they told me You're, you've been um, terminated. I ended up getting a job in a metal shop, becoming a full-fledged machinist. Uh, initially I was getting paid minimum wage and it wasn't enough to survive. I ended up driving for Lyft at least eight, nine, 10 hours a night just stacking my money and stacking my money so that I can make a way out of that situation. What we have is a situation where there are no jobs in the community, and because of this strike on their record, there's no future of a job. So it's the lack of access and then the lack of even having the opportunity to get access that our communities are facing. People are not even getting enough money to survive. You know what I'm saying? Even in a full-time job. I recently was offered an opportunity to work with East Bay Alliance for Sustainable Economy. The work that I'll be doing is policy advocacy work. If you're starting to do all of those, use that sheet. That's where I pulled out. We are trying to push the envelope so that any development in Oakland is development done with an understanding of hiring locally. I have to create a call center and hiring fair chance and people who are impacted by the criminal justice system. That's something I love about the work that I do. I think I'm really gonna be hitting the ground running. Yeah. So I already have, again, like a presentation of what needs to be done. There is a direct connection between mass incarceration and employment. This isn't because black communities are somehow deficient. It's because the economic underpinning of our families completely disappeared. And in America, if you don't have an economic underpinning, you cannot survive.
You can find sidewalk food vendors all over L.A. It turns out they're all illegal. There's a new plan to legalize street vending in Los Angeles, but with new restrictions, too. There's a battle brewing between those vendors and small business owners who say their money is on the line. The vendors are asking city officials how they can make a living without getting arrested. Request the city attorney to prepare and present an ordinance to establish a sidewalk vending program as approved by the council. Los Angeles is the only major city in the U.S. that currently outlaws street vending. And so this committee is studying ways to make street vendors legal. We're going to begin with the general public comment. Hi, I'm a community member from Marlita. Now we're just overran by a lot of these vendors and it's hurting our communities a lot. We've got alcoholics coming in, in, in buying tacos and it's unhealthy for our children. The problem we have with the street vendors, their cleanliness, uh, they just do not follow the rules. We don't want it in our neighborhood. A lot of these businesses, these street vendors, it's not what you consider a uh, economic opportunity. It's more of a tax evading advantage thank, because thank it's you. cash. Thank you for your comments. Thank you sir. for your time. Thank you. We've heard people say that street vending makes our city look like we're in a third world country. When we hear these health and safety concerns, about places like Hollywood. There are larger business entities who are dehumanizing that experience. We're taking this very seriously. This isn't a joke. This is something that could actually hurt a lot of women. Que hasta ahora se están dando cuenta que nosotros somos pequeñas empresas. No estamos registradas, pero sí estamos aportando a la ciudad. Así como ellos son trabajadores, también nosotros somos madres, familias trabajadoras que estamos sustento día tras día. Por eso deben de analizarnos que necesitamos una legalización para poder trabajar legalmente y no nos vuelvan a discriminar como lo están haciendo ahorita. Dicen muchas, vienen por un sueño americano. Yo no vine por un sueño americano. Bye, mamá. Económicamente yo estaba bien en México, pero el, el cuando pero un matrimonio nunca es perfecto porque pues yo yo me vine a este país porque él él fue muy cruel conmigo. Siempre buscaba la forma de que a mí no me, no me dañara porque mi mamá fue la que vio, mi mamá, porque yo tengo una hermana. Yo nunca creí haber, haber conocido este país porque yo nunca salí de México. Nunca. Pues yo le doy, yo estoy, le doy gracias a mi mamá que me, me, me enseñó a ser una persona independiente. Porque ser independiente, este, no estamos a, a ver quién me da, no me da. Ser independiente es que yo puedo trabajar, sé trabajar. Ok. In most public conversations about economic informality, immigration looms large. One of the central myths around the informal economy is that migrants come to the United States and bring the informality with them. The more accurate portrayal is an economy that has what seems to be an insatiable demand for low-wage work. Depending on the economic circumstance, we welcome immigrants or we push them away. 
we see different moments in time when we've had very restrictive policies put in place. And one of the first ones was the Chinese Exclusion Act that specifically targeted Chinese immigrants and basically told them to go home. The National Origin Act set quotas by countries, but really privileging European countries. Then we had the Bracero program. During the war, a farm labor shortage developed. Mexican workers were brought in to meet the emergency. Then the war ended. Now employers prefer Mexican nationals to domestic labor, not because of some sentimental attachment for Mexican food or Mexican culture. It is because imported Mexican labor forces down the real wages of American farm workers. So the Bracero program is a guest worker program, a binational program between the United States and Mexico. And that was during and after World War II where the United States, they were in desperate need of agriculture labor. The Bracero program, which ended in 1964, brought in 4.5 million workers from Mexico. But overnight, because the program ended, they basically became undocumented they joined the informal economy. Mi papá era bracero aquí en Estados Unidos. En 1969 fue cuando él pudo arreglarnos, emigrarnos y fue cuando nos trajo para acá para Estados Unidos. Nosotros trabajábamos en el fil, piscando naranja, toronja, limón. Ese trabajo es muy pesado. Tiene uno que cargar morral y trabajar de ocho hasta nueve horas o a veces hasta más. Yo llegué aquí a, en el 1974. Tenía como 18 años. Vine con mi papá aquí a Mexicali y pues no tenía papeles. Era muy complicado porque en el trabajo siempre llegaba la que le dice uno la migra y seguido nos llevaba para la frontera y, y volvíamos y volvimos y aquí todavía. Ya gracias a Dios desde el 86 para acá estamos bien. Teníamos que trabajar los dos forzosamente para poder salir adelante. Fue cuando encontramos este lugar aquí y decidimos comprarlo. Siempre nos dicen el dátil que nos, se produce aquí está muy bueno. ¿Cómo podemos hacer para ayudarles? Es muy buena pregunta. A que ustedes puedan vender lo que ustedes producen para que tengan otro ingreso. Si yo hago, vamos a decir, unas 500 libras con pesar. Ajá. El impacto va a decir, no, pues yo, yo lo compro, pero necesito 30 mil libras. <ríe> Entonces ya se puede uno poner el dato porque ya no tiene uno para vender. Ellos están interesados en grandes volúmenes de producción. Sí. They are very entrepreneurial family. And one of their interests is to cultivate dates. Their date palms that is providing an opportunity to have an additional income for their household. Yo lo limpio y lo empaco. 
damos a los, las cajas de 5 libras las vendemos a 20 dólares. One of the myths of the informal economy is that through your own initiative and entrepreneurialism, you can become your own business in a sense. What it misses is that there has to be access to a market. In the case of a small scale farmer, getting those products into a supermarket is a very difficult thing to do. And so the access to market often is the main barrier to entrepreneurship. And so we don't see a wide open economy, a new frontier where anyone with enough drive and gumption can make it. But instead we see a disguised employment relationship, new forms of vulnerabilities and widespread inequality. To a great degree, we live in a society where policies have been designed, both locally, regionally, and nationally, to disenfranchise people. Worker centers have existed for a long time, but having a black worker center that focuses on issues that affect black workers, that's what we do. The goal of worker centers is to stabilize people's lives, to fight back against precarious work, to fight back against the informalization of work more generally. There were about five of them, so how many jobs were you able to finish? I could get a full-time job. You know, I have a lot of connections. I could find the job. But the thing is now, I'm thinking about the long run. And I could get either a minimum wage, regular job, work full-time, and make money, whatever. It's not going to be much, you know, but it's something. Or I could think about the long run and do some where I'll have full benefits, make better money, you know, and I could actually go somewhere and continue to do something. Well, me personally, I've never had a job, period. So this is my first ever opportunity to be able to go through a program like this that was, was going to actually land me a job that could create a financial stable future. We have workforce development. And after workforce development training, we have a mentoring component to help navigate the workforce arena or just everyday practical life situations, right? Yeah, so how you been? I'm in all right. All right, what's going on in your life right now? Um, basically right now, just working the night shift. There's not adequate programs available to assist formerly incarcerated people or people who are impacted by the criminal justice system. In the daytime, I've just been relaxing my mind, preparing myself for the, the county job. Mm -hmm. When you first come home from a situation like I came home, it's not easy thinking on a positive scale, but I took the time. The kind of bad jobs that are available to people when they come home are jobs that does not provide an opportunity for a stable life. In all due respect, I was one of them people that was written off. I was a very angry young man, frustrated, didn't know how to deal with my emotions. Spending four and a half years in Pelican Bay Shoe, I remember thinking like, well, I'm gonna die in prison if I don't change something about myself. I remember a guy who was in protective custody and he had a bag of books, literally a bag of books. And he kept saying like, do you wanna read these books? No, I'm just gonna leave them in front of your door. It was a lot of different things. It was stuff on like Aristotle, Socrates. It was a Bahia Vida Gita, a Buddhist material, um, and it was a Quran. And that book kind of really changed my life, and it introduced me to Islam. <laughs> The mentors for people who are impacted by the criminal justice system should also be people who are impacted by the criminal justice system. Um, they act like a beacon of hope and light, like this is what I've done, I've been through this. I can identify and relate to your issues and your struggles and advocate for you. 
after we get done, I'll email him as well as text him and uh, make sure he do a follow through on the jobs. I've been able to navigate multiple different situations of being homeless and then now having a stable home, not having a car and now owning my car. Being able to have a full time employment doing work that I love to do. I do see myself continuing to do this work and really becoming a voice of change. And I, just in that period of time, I didn't see The like, opportunity, I think, of organizing and community is a part of turning that pain and understanding and learning and thinking about strategies and solution and really through action, feeling like you are part of this democracy, that you do matter, that your voice matters, and that you can make a difference. This is my dad, uh, Reverend P. Tony Lao Wenger, and of course that's me, Anaseko Wenger, here at the First Salmon Church of Los Angeles. It's a great thing to come here for us because we can congregate as like a village. Did you guys want to take a picture? Thank you so much. And that's why even in this workers' riot and social economic justice here in America, that's what we need to do. We need to work as a village to make sure that each one of our brothers and sisters, no matter what struggle they're going through, be able to pull them up. When we talk about workers who are finding it hard to get by, again, what is a good job? But we want good quality jobs. We have some of the most productive, hard workers in all of the world here in the United States of America. I don't think that our economy should be built on a structure of exploitation. We are a nation of laws. There are laws to protect these workers and they are not being enforced. These are actually misclassified employees. There is a violation of wage and hour laws that they're having to work below minimum wage, work without meal and rest breaks. If they run through a stop sign, they're going to get banned from the docks. If they do anything wrong, they're kicked out. Yet here are these large trucking companies that have all the power, can break the law with abandon, and are still allowed to do business there. Billions of dollars are generated through our LA and Long Beach port alone, yet we are getting pennies. <laughs> The drivers, they've been very frustrated and very angry, and so they have voted to go on strike now 15 times over the last four years. And it's official, the strike is on, at least at this trucking company here in Wilmington. Three companies at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach are on strike. They were seen picketing outside the company's yards in Wilmington. We're just beginning this battle. We aren't going away. We're going to be here again. We'll be here tomorrow. We'll be here next week. We'll be here the week after that. The Teamsters are going to win. We're going to win. When analysts try to identify when we started to really notice a reemergence in the informal economy, many point back to a period in the late 1970s, early 1980s, where we saw a number of, of policy changes within the economy. First and foremost was the beginning of a concerted assault on labor unions. Ronald Reagan fired 12,000 air traffic controllers after they violated federal laws against striking. I must tell those who failed to report for duty this morning, they are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. It's happening all over the country. Union membership is down, and more and more industries are beginning to unravel and dismantle some of the union contracts 
that were fashioned during the healthier years of the labor movement. At that point, we start to see significant erosion of employment conditions, the minimum wage. We see that the role of the government is being redefined. Instead of being about providing protection for workers, the role of the government becomes to attract investors, to promote businesses, to stimulate the economy. You don't want government to interfere with market activity. The free market should rule. The free market enables people to buy in the cheapest market around the world. If they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. Neoliberalism is essentially an ideological commitment to the free market, to the idea that the market governs best. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Neoliberalism is a change in ideology regarding the role of the state. And globalization is something that happens in parallel. And in the 1970s, we entered a new era of globalization. We're losing to the competition. We are only strong when we are willing to compete with the whole world. General Motors confirmed it today. It is going to close plants employing almost 30,000 workers. Ford alone has laid off 50,000 men. One in nine men and women is out of work. What's the situation in Detroit like at the moment? It don't look good. It doesn't look good at all. Many people talk of globalization as if it came from on high somehow. Uh, no, this was a policy. We could have done globalization differently. We pitted American manufacturing workers against some of the lowest wage, lowest standard workforces all over the world. Around the same time, we also saw uh, efforts to reform welfare and to make it more restrictive unemployment insurance as well to make it more restrictive. When I ran for president four years ago, I pledged to end welfare as we know it. I have worked very hard for four years to do just that. A lot of the supports that were the basis of sustained economic growth in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s really begin to be eliminated. And so informality grows up in that space. Neoliberalism became popularized by Reagan, but it continued with all the president that followed. And it has become such a dominant ideology that presidents on both sides of the political divide adopt that premise. I think it is no coincidence that what we have seen with the rise of neoliberalism is also the rise of economic inequality. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points after two pillars of the street tumbled over the weekend. So in just six months, three of the five biggest independent firms on Wall Street have now disappeared. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis. The news from Wall Street has shaken the American people's faith in our economy. When you blow up the economy like we did, many people lost their homes, let alone massive unemployment. And so now, you know, we're 10 years out from that and they're trying to just get back what they lost. We have to be very concerned because we haven't learned the lessons of our first experience of globalization. We didn't learn the lessons in the ways in which human dignity were violated that is happening across our communities through informal labor, through formal labor, through the erosion of worker rights, through the intersections of race and capitalism. We are at this moment where our economy is changing quickly we're really seeing a new kind of work becoming the new norms, but that's why it's important to pay attention to the informalization of the economy. country, justice and the fight for real change has never come easy. You know that back in the 20s and the 30s and before that, workers put their lives on the line. They went to jail 
and sometimes they died standing up for workers' rights and justice. The system has not created any sort of accountability to the workers who create the wealth for those industries. What do you do when you are working as hard as you can and you can't seem to gain ground? You can't pick up and move. Where, where can you go? When we stand together, there are a hell of a lot more of us than there are of them. should be thriving in an economy that is as rich as the one here in the U.S. We could change the rules. We could do things a different way. Uh, we are on the brink of, of taking an historic action today that I think is long overdue. Uh, five years ago, Councilman Rezar and I proposed uh, legalizing street vending, uh, as cities have done all over the world. So if we could please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes, four noes. So that is approved. Okay, wait a minute. Please, please let us continue our business and congratulations. Y sinceramente fueron nueve años de lucha y es para nosotros, para lo menos lo que me toca a mí, es historia porque si no hubieran sido por estos dos campeones, no hubiéramos estado donde estamos aquí. Y a nombre de todos los compañeros, gracias. 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 Pues en el futuro queremos trabajar ya legalmente, que, que ya trabajemos legalmente, que ya, no, que ya seamos tratados como cualquier pequeña empresa. Que seamos, porque también nosotros aportamos a la, a la ciudad. Nunca me gustó ser que una persona me mande. Por eso a mí eso es lo que me hizo ser vendedora. Toda mi vida he sido vendedora. Pues más que nada es tratar de, de, de que crezca más, más grande, más palmas y Y al rato este, pues ya, ya, quisiera hasta aquí. Voy a, a mirar un, un día donde ya yo nomás esté mirando ya si, si uno de los nietos quiere a trabajar ahí, ahí va a tener trabajo. Y como va a ser para ellos, pues que aprovechen. The American dream, <laughs> the American dream for me is to be able to provide for my family. And I think that's what everybody wants to do. They, they want to enjoy going to work and get paid a fair wage for it. I don't have to be your family. I, I'm not blood with you. I'm not related with you. But I'm family as fellow citizen, a fellow human being. Some of our family in this port trucking industry have been left behind. But we're running. We're running the race. And we're going to make sure that we make it no matter how big I am. I'm going to keep running as fast, as hard as I can with this ton of bricks on my back. Because I, I, don't, I don't care how much more they put on me. It's not going to stop me. It, it can't. It's a big question. How do you formalize the informal economy? But the answer is very simple. A worker is a worker, not an employee, not an independent contractor. It's 
been a downright assault on labor in this country. But in the end, it's policy and people getting involved. These are the same families that are left behind and the same families that are now leading at the forefront a struggle to redefine what work is, to create policies that address the harm that has been done by policy structures. There is a growing effort now to essentially define a new social contract for California in the 21st century, where we make a pledge to the next generation to give them the greatest likelihood of being able to pursue a healthy life. We can't afford not to invest in all of our people. Oh, what? That's spelled the correct way, too. <laughs> Thank you, man. Oh, I appreciate this, man. City Rising is made possible in part by the California Endowment.